in our last class of the tafsir to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we looked at the beginning of hijrah of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hijrah of the sahaba. And when we looked at the hijrah of the sahaba radiallahu anhum, we said the first person to make hijrah was who? Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we talked about how they prevented Ummu Salama and Salama from hijrah. So one of the methodologies or the ways that was employed by the mushrikeen of Quraysh to stop people making hijrah was what? At tafriq To separate between a man, his wife and the child. Now we mentioned last week, this is not one of the methods only that they employed. They employed many other methods. From those methods which they employed, we're going to look at today, inshallah ta'ala, is the method of abduction and rendition, forced rendition. So when you look at all these methods which they employed, you find, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Quran, tashabahat qulubuhum. Their hearts are the same and they're similar. Meaning, no matter what time they live in, in the kuffar, no matter what location they are in, they employ the same methodology. So rendition, forced kidnapping, abduction is not new. They were doing this in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it didn't only suffice the mushrikeen of Quraysh to stop them leaving or to separate between a husband and a wife and a child. Whoever made it to Medina, they used to attempt to forcibly bring them back from Medina. And how would they do this? Being that, that the, the Ansar, they gave pledge of allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of mana'a to protect and to fight. How would they be able to do this? They couldn't do it like that. So they employed trickery and games to bring back the Sahaba from Medina to Mecca. So Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he mentioned this. So Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he mentioned or narrated the story of his hijrah and the ways of the mushikeen in abduction. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, لما تعدت, يعني لما أردنا الهجرة إلى المدينة أنا وعياش وابن أبي عياش ابن أبي ربيعة وهشام ابن العاص ابن وائل السهمي. He said, when we intended to make hijrah, me and Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'a and Hisham as Suhami, when we decided we're going to leave Mecca, we're going to Medina for Hijrah. We're going to make the migration. He said, we all decided to meet at an appointed po a place, appointed place. And he said, this place was 10 miles outside Mecca. So they chose a specific place. And they chose that when they leave, they leave individually. Each one leaves by himself. And he chose a specific time. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he went on to say, that I said to them, that ayyuna lam yusbih indaha faqad hubis. That whoever does not reach that appointed time in the morning, we have to be considered to be what? Hubisa, he's been captured. If he doesn't reach, he's been captured. فَلْيَمْضِ صَاحِبَاهُ So therefore, if he comes to the morning, he's not there, we assume he's captured, and the other two, they continue upon their journey. Don't wait. We continue. So whoever doesn't reach there, we consider that he's being captured. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, فَأَصْبَحْتُ أَنَا وَعَيَّاشْ ibn Abi Rabi'a. He said, we reached there. Me and Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'a. So who's missing? Hisham. He said, وَحُبِسَ And Hisham was captured. And what happened to him? وَفْتُتِنَا and they made fitna for him. What tutina here means they forced him to leave his religion. They forced him to leave the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar went on to say, When we reach Medina, we reach the tribe of Banu Amr in Quba. He said, when we reach there, it wasn't over yet. Abu Jahl ibn Hisham, Harith ibn Hisham. On their trails as well, Abu Jahl and Harith. But now they're in Medina, and they know the Ansar are known for their fighting and their bravery. They couldn't force them to go back, so they sent Abu Jahan and his, and his brother, who was Harith ibn Hisham. They sent these two brothers to who? To Ayash. Why did they send these two people to Ayash? Umar radiallahu an, he said, وَكَانَ إِبْنُ عَمِّهِمَا وَأَخَاهُمَا لِأُمِّهِمَا The Ayash was their cousin of Abu Jahan and Harith. So they sent these two people to him, that these were his cousins. So they sent these people to him, and 
uh, and he was a brother to them through their mother. How was he a brother to them through their mother? Through suckling. So this their cousin, and they suckled from the same breast. So they sent them to Ayyash. So when they got to Ayyash, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they said to him, and they tried to convince him to come back. What, you know what they quote him on? They said, Inna ummaka qad nadarat alla tamus rasaha hatta tara. Your mother is given a nadar. She's given a vow, an oath, that she will never ever let the comb touch her hair until she sees you. And the Arabs, when they give an oath, they'll follow it. In those days, they used to stick to those oaths. So therefore, when somebody gives an oath to do something, they will definitely, most likely, they will do it. And this happened with another Sahabi, who was this Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas. His mother said, if you do not leave the deen, I will continue to starve myself. I'll go on a hunger track until you leave this deen. So she started one day, two days, three days, and they stick to this oath till she almost died. And the people came to Sa'ad ibn Waqas. Are you going to kill your own mother? So he said, and he went to his mother, he said, Ya Ummah, O oh mother, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to give you 99 souls and one was to leave after the other, I'll never leave the deen. She started to eat immediately. Because they're gonna leave the deen. So they said, your mother has promised she's not going to let the comb touch her hair until she sees you. And she's never going to sit in the shade. So you sit in the intense heat of Mecca until she sees you. His heart felt soft and he felt pity upon her. فقلت له عمر رضي الله عنه he said I said to him عياش إنه والله يريدك يريد القوم يريدك القوم إلا ليفتنوك that by Allah these people did not to want to do anything except to make you leave your religion فحذرهم be aware of them so Umar said to him فوالله لو قد أذى أمك القمل لم تشطت. If the head lices, she refused to comb her hair, right, and wash her hair. When the head lices start to eat up her head, she will soon comb her hair. Don't worry about that. And he said, "Walau for Wallahi, walau ishtada alayha har Mecca lastadhalat." And when the heat of Mecca it hits her, she will soon find a shade. So don't worry, she will do it. She will comb her hair and she will find a shade. But he said, you know what? I have to be good to my mother, subhanAllah. And this shows, subhanAllah, how they bring people back to, to, to which that which is sentimental to you. And in the time we're living in today, we said the zero is an example for us. They do not necessarily force you to go back, fear you lose your deen, but situation and circumstances for those people who have left the land of the non-Muslims, where it's a fitna for their deen, the fitna for the deen of their children, this is one of the angles, the parents. If there's nobody else to look after your parents and you don't fear for your deen, you're going to lose your deen, but you fear for your children reasonably and there's nobody else, you might have to go back and take care of your parents. But we have situations whereby people have siblings to take care of their parents, but they'll still say, you know what, I have to go back. Even when the parents themselves say, you know what, son, I'm okay by myself. This is one of the doors she thought, oh, I'm going back because of my mother. I'm going back because of my father. This is one of the traps of shaitan for those who made it out. And many, they lose their children in this environment. Even though they got other siblings. But his heart, his heart felt bad for his mother. But Umar already gave him the way out. She will do what she has to do. So when he said this, he said to Umar radiallahu an, Wali hunaka malun And this is the other trap for many people. He said, you know what? Other than my mother, I have some wealth, assets and property in Mecca that I want to go and collect. And this is a trap for many people likewise. It could be the council flat, it could be the benefits, it could be that wages are better there and they end up going back. He said, I have some wealth, I want to go and take there. So Umar said, He said, I said to him, By Allah, you know me, Umar, I'm from the richest of the Quraysh. From the richest of the Quraysh. If you're going back because of wealth, I'm going to give you half of all my wealth. Half of it. And this shows the brotherhood of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. That when they give you a solution or suggestion, it's not something going to be working on yourself. They're going to be involved in that solution. He said, if it's wealth, I'll give you half of my wealth. So Umar said, فَأَبَعَ عَلَيَّ إِلَّا أَنْ يَخْرُجْ مَعَهُمَا He refused and he decided to leave with them. 
And even though he refused the advice of Umar, he said, when I saw his refuse to do what I told him to do, I gave him one of my camels. And he said, this camel was fast and it was low. It's easy to get on. Because due to much work and much travel, it become lowered. So I said, take this camel with you. If you need to flee, flee with this camel. So Umar gave him the camel, radiallahu anhu. So Abu Jahl, Hisham, and Harith. And upon the way, Abu Jahl, knowing that this camel is a fast camel, he said, Wallahi, my camel is very tired now. What do you think? If me and Harith will ride on the same camel with you. So they got onto his camel. They knew he was going to flee. So they were going. They were going. Upon the way now, they attacked him. They attacked him and they tied him up. And when they tied him up, they made sure they entered Mecca during the daylight hours. Why? To make him an example for others. He entered Mecca with his hands tied and his foot tied. And they told the people of Mecca, they called all of them, they said, Ya Ahla Mecca, Hakada fafa'alu bi sufaha'ikum. Do such things to the foolish ones amongst you. Kama fa'alna bi safihina hadha. The same way we did to this foolish one from amongst us. So he entered Mecca, they kidnapped him and reditioned him back to Mecca. Umar radiallahu anhu. This incident, there's lots we could learn from, from this. One of the first things, we could learn from this incident is that after this incident, Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Kunna naqul, we used to say after this incident, Mallahu biqabil maftutina sarfan. Allah, yawm qiyamah, will never accept any deed from anybody who has gone through this hardship and be forced to leave his, his deen. They said, Wala adlan wala tawbatan. And his tawbah, his repentance will never be accepted. Why? They say, Qawma arafu Allah, thumma raja'u ila al-kufr. These are people, they knew Allah, and they went back to kufr to disbelief. Allah is not going to accept anything from them, not even no repentance. So Umar radiallahu an, he said, we used to say that, because they did this, libala'in asabahu. Due to some hardship they went through, they left the deen. Allah is not going to accept that. that. So he said, وَكَانَ يَقُولُنَا ذَلِكَ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ So he said, they used to say that to each other. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an ayah. They said this ayah, Arja al ayah fi kitabillah. This verse is the verse which is Arja. Arja in Arabic means what? Hope. And in Arabic, you have something called Ismu Tafdil, that which is comparatively better. Yes, comparison. For example, Hassan is good, and better is Ahsan. Fadl is what? That which is also good, bountiful. And that which is more bountiful is what? Af dal. Jayid? So he said, Adil ayah arja. This ayah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ulama said, is the one that gives the most hope. This ayah is known as arja ul ayah, the ayah that gives the most hope. He said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his saying, Da qul ya ibadi ya ladina asrafu ala anfusihim. لا تقنتوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Say, oh my servants, those who have wronged themselves excessively, لا تقنتوا. Don't give up hope concerning the mercy of Allah. إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Allah سبحانه وتعالى forgives all sins. إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. Verily is the forgiven the most merciful. وأنيب إلى ربكم وأسلم لا من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب ثم لا تنصرون. And repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before a punishment comes to you, you'll not be able to be aided. And Allah ta'ala goes on to say, وَاتَّبِعُوا أَحْسَنَ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And follow the best of that which has been sent down to you from your Lord مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ بَغْتَةً وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Before the punishment comes to you, all of a sudden you do not perceive. So this was sent down regarding these Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala an. So Umar radiallahu an, after this, he said, فَكَتَبْتُهَا He said, Umar, after this ayah came down, this is a person you've advised. He didn't listen to you. On top of your advice, you gave him wealth. He still didn't listen to you. On top of that, you gave him your camel. He still didn't listen to you. But despite all that, Umar said, when this ayah came down, كَتَبْتُهَا بِيَدِي I wrote down these verses with my own hands. And I sent it to him in Makkah. Despite all of this, to show the brotherhood. He said, I wrote it down my own hand, I sent it Hisham, the first one to be captioned, Hisham ibn al-As. He said, when this reached Hisham, 
He said, فَلَمَّا أَتَتْنِي جَعَلْتُ أَقْرَأُهَا بِذَيْتُوَا I used to go to the outskirts of Mecca from one of the valleys and climb on top of those valleys and read it by myself. He said, I did not understand what he was saying. So I said to Allah, Allahumma fahimniha. Oh Allah, make me understand it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alqa Allahu fi qalbi annaha innama unzilat fina. Allah made me understand that these verses were said down concerning me and Ayyash. And after that, he made tawbah and made it to Medina to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The lessons we could learn from this statement Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, or this incident with Umar radiallahu an, the first lesson we learn from this is this. That Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, although he had given his brother all of these advice, he didn't give up. He kept advising him and he kept trying with him. So the previous surah which we looked at that we spoke about was what surah to? What surah? La surah to al asr. Surah al asr. So when we look at the action of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we could see the practical implementation of surah to al asr. How do we see this? The practical implementation of surah al asr in, in this incident of Umar radiallahu anhu. Huh? The first we see in Surah Al-Asr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا One of the attributes, first attributes is Iman. And Hijrah, even making the Hijrah itself is from Iman, to leave the land of the Muslim Muslim. As Allah ta'ala says, يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ أَرْضِ وَاسِعَةً All oh my servants, those who have Iman, my earth is vast. Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala says, Allah called these people, بِسْمِ Iman in the name of Iman. So, so he joins from Iman. Secondly, with his action with Ayyash, where is, where is the Iman? The Iman is, we said Al Iman is what? Knowledge and actions. And what was the action of Umar with his brother? To love for his brother what he loves for himself. This is from Iman. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخي ما يحب لنفسه. None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. He's ready to give him half of his wealth. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا is to love each other as Muslims. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَا تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا You will never enter Jannah until you do what? Until you believe. وَلَن تُؤْمِنُوا You will never believe حَتَّى تَحَابُوا Until you love one another. So, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا We see this Surah Al-Asr, the implementation by Umar Rajallahu Anhu. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And they do righteous actions. And from the most or the best action you could do with your brother is what? An nasiha To give him sincere advice. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said أَدِّينُوا نَصِيحَ أَدِّينُوا نَصِيحَ أَدِّينُوا نَصِيحَ That this religion is what? Advice. And what is deen? Al-Islam, Al-Iman, and what? Al-Ihsan. So the ulama, they say Al-Nasiha is Iman. Is what? Ihsan and Islam. So one of the best actions you could do for your brother is what? Giving him sincere advice. So Umar radiallahu an, he gave him sincere advice. And then thirdly, وَالتَّوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ To enjoin the haqq upon each other. Did Umar radiallahu an, did he enjoin the haqq upon his brother? Where? How did he enjoin the haqq upon his brother? Mm -hmm. When he did what? Yes. Barakallah. That's the correct answer. Many people have said Umar enjoined the good on his brother when he advised him do not go. When he was ready to give him half of his wealth. No. There's a difference between advising and enjoining. If Umar and enjoined upon him, that do not go. He couldn't. Because in the tafsir of Surah Al-Asr, we said, to enjoin something upon the haqq. What is the haqq? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealed. But the opinion of Umar, he didn't take it personally. He didn't take my opinion. And this is how it should be. Despite he advised him, despite what he feared for him, but it was his what? It was his opinion. It wasn't revelation. So you've advised somebody. You've told him and the thing ends up happening to them. You shouldn't be angry because it's what? It's not wahi. It's not revelation. So Umar radiallahu an, he could not enjoin it upon him. What did he enjoin upon him? The ayah. Because this now is revelation and he sent it to them. 
So Umar radiallahu an tawasaw bil haq he enjoined this upon him wa tawasaw bil sabr and he enjoined sabr and where's the patient of Umar in every single thing in his iman in advising his brother that you're going for your mother you don't need to I'm going for wealth you don't need to in his actions with his brother and in enjoining upon his brother with his eye by sending all the way to Makkah so we see Surah Al-Asr in the action of Umar and this is how the Sahaba radiallahu anhum they used to implement this surah in their lives so Umar radiallahu an will learn from this incidence his patience is calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enjoining the good upon his brother so this was the first way of the Quraysh which is to abduct and forcibly rendition them back to Makkah now the second way was Al-Habs to imprison them so if you remember when they came back with Ayyash what did Abu Jahl tell the people of Makkah Hakada fa'alu bi sufaha'ikum. What we've done now, do that to the foolish amongst you. So as soon as they came back to Makkah, adopted and renditioned, the people of Makkah employed a new thing. Anybody they suspected was going to go for hijrah, they will imprison them. Even if they haven't left, imprisonment. They will make a wall and put them inside that wall. And the difference with those prisons was there was no roof on top of the walls. So they had to deal with the fitna, the tribulation of the loneliness of the prison and the heat of the sun. And they'll have their hands and their leg, legs tied. So they'll tie them by the hands and legs so they couldn't flee. There will be guards, but a wall, a prison with a wall with the heat of Makkah. No, 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 what's it called? No roof at all. And they'll place them there. So they'll place them like this. So this was the way of the people of Makkah, Al Habsu. They will imprison them. And in imprisoning them, these hams which they used to do, they imprisoned Hisham ibn al-As and also Ayyash. And they did this to every single one they thought was going to leave Makkah. However, despite this, many, many people, as we mentioned last week, left what? Left Makkah. And the only one that remained were the Muslim Afin and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ali and Abu Bakr. These were the only people remaining in Makkah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for those that remained in Mecca, بعد هجرته, after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to make dua for them. And this is something in the time we're living in today, that when we find Muslims in a land or in a place or country have been being persecuted for their deen, and we could not help them, the very least we could do is what? A dua. So it was said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, يقنط ويدعو لمستضعفين في مكة. That it will make dua for all of the Mustadafin in Makkah, the weak Muslims in Makkah, Amatan generally, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, li ba'dihim bi asma'ihim khasa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will mention some of them specifically. So for our brothers and our sisters, generally should make dua for them. And those you know specifically in the land of the non Muslims, that either they're being tested in their religion or their children. For those of us from the West, for example, watching our children grow up. And we saw these kids as one, two. Now we're old, they're like 20, 20 something. And news comes to us that subhanAllah, such and such a person's child is in prison. Such and such a person's child has been stabbed. Such and such a person's child has been killed. Such and such a person's child has left the deen. And not only their children, such and such a person is not practicing. When we hear these things, our duty, generally pray for them, is to pray for them specifically. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we pray for them specifically. Mentioning their names. So he said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, in Qunut, in the last raka'ah of Witr, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, that, Allahumma anji Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah. Oh Allah, save Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah. The one that went back with who? Abu Jahl. He would say, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma anji Salama ibn Hisham. Oh Allah, please save Salama ibn Hisham. Allahumma anjil Walid ibn Walid. Oh Allah, save Walid ibn Walid. Allahumma anjil mustad'afina min al mu'mineen. Oh Allah, save the weak ones from the believers. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never left off this issue. He didn't just suffice himself with dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And he said, which one of you will help me in bringing back Ayyash and Hisham? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two other Sahaba, they volunteered to go on a covert operation, enter Makkah secretly, and do a rescue operation. SubhanAllah. Now you wonder, these people are in prison. 
How are they going to get him out of the prison? How do you think they're going to get him out with locks, guards and everything? How are they going to get him out? What was the mistake that the Quraysh made in torturing the Muslims? Huh? No, we mentioned it. They tortured them with open roof. So the Sahaba, when they got there, they met a woman. I said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to take food to them. Okay, just show us the place. They got there. And they climbed over and went in. And then they put what under their feet? Rocks. Because they shackled them. And they took their swords. And this rock was called Mirwa. Yes? So one of the Sahaba became known Abu Mirwa because of that rock. They struck it, struck it, took the chains off, put them on the camel, back to Medina. And they met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it didn't just suffice with du'a. Whatever he can do whilst it's within his capabilities, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did it. The other way of the Quraysh was uslub at tajreed min al mal To freeze and to seize your assets. This is another way of the kuffar today. They seize your assets or they freeze your assets. So those of them that wanted to leave, like Suhaib ibn Sinan al namri Have you ever heard young men of a Sahabi called Suhaib? Suhaib, the Sahabi radiallahu anhu. Yes, Salman. Suhaib, we normally know him as what? Suhaib al Barakallahu fiqh. Very good, boy. May Allah increase you in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Suhaib al Rumi. So when many people are trying to talk about racism in Islam, they said the companions of the Prophet are made of different people. There was Suhaib al Rumi, Suhaib the Roman. There was Bilal al Habashi. But in reality, it was Bilal al Habashi. Habashi was in Ethiopia and left. Nusiba ila umni. It was attributed to his what? To his mother. His mother was Habashiyah. What was his father? Allahu A'lam. So this concept, popular misconception that Bilal radiallahu an was black is a wrong misconception. Bilal radiallahu an was never ever described as being black. By the Sahaba. Some others were. Like Zayd ibn al-Haritha, Abu Dhar, Ali radiallahu an, Umar ibn al-Khattab. It had been very dark. Not black, very dark. Very, very dark. Because the Arab, when they say someone is Aswad, it doesn't mean he's black like me and you. They refer to you as Aswad. So the Prophet said, Bu'ithu ilal aswadi wal ahmari. I've been sent to the black and the red. The red are who? The Europeans. They used to call them red. The Arabs are also Aswad. Aswad could be from anything to tan, olive skin, to very black. But when someone is very black, they say, Shadidul udma. Min Adam. Very, very dark. So when they speak about Abu Dhar, they say Shadidul Udma. It was severely what? Black. So the hadith in which Abu Dhar was supposed to say to Bila, Ya Ibn Sauda, son of a black woman. Shaykh al Albani rahimahullah said this hadith on Bonit Da'if. He didn't say the son of a black woman, he said the son of a foreign, non Arab woman. Ya Ibn al Ajamiya. Because Bila was not described as being what? Dark. Whereas Ali radiallahu an and all of his brothers, and the brothers of Ibn Abbas, Fadl ibn Abbas, it was described as being what? Black. Another word for black like this is akhdar, green. So in the same way people boast about I'm black and proud, the Arabs used to do this in Jahiliyyah. When the poetry of Fadl, the boy ibn Abbas, he said, Ana akhdar man ya'rifuni. Whoever knows me knows I'm truly akhdar, I'm truly black, I'm a black man. As some people like to say with their hands on chest, I'm a black man. So Suhaib al-Rumi, his name was Suhaib al-Namri from the tribe of Namr. So why is he known as Suhaib al-Rumi? For those who speak about racism, there was a Roman. Suhaib was not a Roman. He was not a Roman. He was an Arab. Suhaib al-Rumi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was not a Roman. Suhaib al-Rumi was from a Namr. But the Romans, they came and they fought his people. And they took him as a what? As a captive. And they took him back with them. And he learned their language. And he learned their ways. So when he came back to Mecca, Nusiba ila al rum the attribute associated with what? Roman. So they call him Suhaib al Rumi, but he wasn't Roman. Just like now, when I was in Kenya, Kenya, a white person, they call him Muzungu. So when they speak about me, they say, Where's that black Muzungu? Where's that black white man? I know it doesn't make sense. So they, <laughs> they used to call me black Muzungu, the black white man, you know? So many people, when they meet me, say he's British. Even when I go to Nigeria, even when I try and speak the lingo, whatever you do, ah, British, oh, British boy, London boy, that's how they know you. Even if you also go back to Pakistan, they just know you as the British. 
right? So it surprises me when you come to this region of the world and someone asks you, are you from myself, from England? I say, no, 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 yeah, yeah, asal, 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 asal. Subhanallah. The Arabs themselves, they attribute you to that in the past. And that's why before there was no such thing as nationality. Some of the ulama, they would say it was Makki, Meccan, Madani, Farisi. Ma why? Because when he lives in a place for a certain time or period, it's considered to be that nationality. This issue of nationality is a new thing. The Muslims didn't have these borders. So it could be Nigeria, Mali, Senegal, Britani, Makki. Many people that are Makki now, they're not originally from Makkah. You find many Hausawi, Fulani, Falata, Asindi. And they're Makki because they've lived there. So this issue, when you say to somebody, say, La, 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 akhi, asa, asa, la, la, Pakistani, yeah? Forget that. Britani, Britani, full stop. Amriki, Amriki. Nonsense. Because sometimes they do it to do what? To try to push you down. That's what you are. But the asal, yes, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm Nigerian. So Suhaib al-Rumi and Nimri, when he came back with the Romans, he was very poor because he came back as a captive. So Suhaib al-Rumi, when he wanted to make Hijr, and at that time he had worked in Mecca and he became very, 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 very rich. The mushrikeen of Mecca, they said to him, that, Ya Suhaib, ataytana you came to us as a very poor, impoverished person. Haqiran, somebody haqir, someone you look down on, somebody useless. Yes, فَكَثُرَ مَا لُكَ عِنْدَنَا وَبَلَغْتَ مَا بَلَغْتَ ثُمَّ تَنْطَلِقْ بِنَفْسِكَ وَمَالِكَ They said to him, you've reached or achieved what you've achieved. Now you want to leave us with your wealth and yourself? They said that will never happen. And this is some of the things they do nowadays. Your nationality, your citizenship is not free. It's not free. Your wealth is not free attained there. So they said to him, you're not going to leave us like this. So Suhaib, radiallahu an, he said, أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ تَرَقْتُ مَالِي تَخْلُونَ أَنْتُمْ سَبِيلِي He said, what if I leave my wealth? Are you going to leave my path alone, allow me to live in peace? I leave my wealth, everything. And he was very rich, Suhaib al-Rumi. Because he was a what? He was a blacksmith. And he had shops, he had wealth, he used to design their weapons. So they said, Naam. He gave them every single one of his wealth, all his wealth. And when this reached the Prophet, the Prophet said, Rabiha. Because business is about profits. He said, Rabiha Suhaib. Suhaib has really made a lot of profit here. He gave up all his wealth for what? For the sake of Hijrah. He's made a lot of profit. So he left. فَلَمَّا خَرَجَ السُّحَيْبَ الرُّومِ When Suhaib left, مُهَاجِرًا تَبِعَهُ أَهْلَ مَكَّةِ That the people of Mecca, they followed him. And he knew they were going to follow him. Even though he gave them all of his wealth, they still followed him. Because such people, even when you give them everything you have, they still believe you have what? You have more. So they followed him. فَنَثَلًا So Suhaib ibn Suhaib al-Rumi, Nathala, he went to, into his bag. And he already prepared himself as a blacksmith. He went to, into his bag, Suhaib al-Rum, فَأَخْرَجَ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعِينَ سَهْمًا When he went to his bag, he took out 40 harrows from his bag. He was prepared. فَقَالْ لَا تَصِلُونَ إِلَيَّ حَتَّى أَضْعَ فِي كُلِّ رَجِلُ مِنْكُمْ سَهْمًا I know you're coming to me. You will never reach me until I've made sure, you see these 40 arrows? I've put it in each and every single man. 40. But they didn't come out as 40 only. And even if you have 40, you may miss some. So Suhaib al-Rumi, radiallahu an, he said to them, ثُمَّ أَصِيرْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى السَّيْفِ فَتَعَلَّمُوا فَتَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَجُلٌ He said, you see when all these 40 hours are finished, أَصِيرُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى السَّيْفِ فَتَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَجُلٌ After they finish, I'll go to my sword. And at that point, you know I'm truly a man. But, not to have to do all that with them, Suhaib al-Rumi, radiallahu ta'ala an, he said to them, لَقَدْ خَلَفْتُ بِمَكَّةِ قَيْنَتَيْنِ I've left in Mecca two maids or two female slaves. I've left that in Mecca. Yes? فَهُمَا لَكُمْ The both of them, you could have them. Because he understood their mentality. They're not fighting for no cause. It's all what? Material. That's why they say those of those days and today, they don't have any what cause, they don't have any friends, they don't have any allies, but what do they have? Interest. 
Once you understand their mentality, it's all about interest. So you understood. They're not fighting fi sabili lat or fi sabili uzza. They're fighting fi sabili nada. So they have to. They left him, and he went to Mecca. Suhaib al Rumi radiallahu an. And then he said, Ikrima radiallahu an. Ikrima, the son of who? Abu Jahl. He said, after he did what he did, it was said that this ayah was sent down for Suhaib, a memory of Suhaib al Rumi. The ayah is Surah Baqarah 207, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَ وَبِتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ رَفُوءٌ بِالْعِبَادِ For mankind are those who trade themselves seeking what? The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Suhaib al Rumi radiallahu ta'ala an, he knew how corrupted their mind was. They're the only after what? Wealth and materialistic thing. So this is one of the way of or one of the ways of the Quraysh from the four ways. And the four ways are what? Division, dividing. Which they do nowadays as well. That you are what you are, Mr. Luqman, but your son is ours. He's a British. You could stay wherever you stay. And we saw this recently. Whereby they will let a child in, but they say the mother no. And then the father, somewhere else. Even though it's called a what? It's called a union. The father should be able to travel anywhere within that what? So-called union. If it's a citizenship, citizen of any of those countries. I'm not approving of the actions of those people, but the reality of their laws. That's how they are. They'll divide a mother and a child. Secondly, habsu, which is to imprison you and force you. You understand? And rendition to a point that I'm not talking about people that have committed offenses or people involved in terrorism, people that are not involved in any of those things. They say, you know what, you don't want us here, we leave. And then they leave, they still bring them back. Why? <laughs> and then the third way is what? Leave all your assets. That's it, you cannot leave with these things. So you have Muslim organizations sometimes that are doing charity, helping people outside. And the bro one brother gave me very good advice if you're going to get involved in such things, you have to make sure your, your account is very clear, very transparent. Because that's one of the things they use, that where is this money going to? And have many Muslim organizations, they've frozen their assets. You know, so you have to be very, very transparent. Next week, insha'Allah ta'ala, and I think it's going to be the last call for Ramadan, but we want to continue after Ramadan, is going to be about, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, trying not to miss it, why the person chose Medina. And the fadl, the excellences of Medina. And for those who have read the hadith about excellence of Medina, amazing. About the excellence of Medina. The barakah, the blessings of Medina, insha'Allah. And if we continue after Ramadan, we're going to go to one, two surah, and then the hijr of Prophet himself, insha'Allah. If we continue in Ramadan. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, shadwan, da'ila, anta, astaghfirullah. Any questions, insha'Allah?